uh, looked at a number of different uh, things with uh, trip data, looked at how people rode when they rode with, you know, tried to actually link up and figure out if people were riding together with uh, or by themselves and what types of trips they were taking together or by themselves. Uh, and so that's kind of what some of the graphics represent here. And I'm not going to do this justice at all. And I would suggest to everyone that you just look at it on the website. But anyway, um, so that, that looked at a number of different questions on riding with uh, riding together. Do, you, uh, pe do people um, uh, dock surf, which is dock and undock, uh, and then continue their trip? And how often do people um, actually start and end at the same station? And so uh, that's what um, was presented here. Can you go to the next page? So then from that, got broken down into more uh, what people actually use Divi for. So people, do they use it for fun? Do they use it for transportation? Um, and then what does that lead to uh, as far as things like um, using it for transportation? If you're using it for transportation, uh, the, the likelihood that you're going to incur overtime fees versus folks who actually use it for fun and th that likelihood and what those overtime fees turn out to be. Um, and about 46% of the total got overtime, had overtime fees for transportation, and about 54% have overtime fees uh, for fun, uh, based on the summary. Um, but it's clearly that you know that's obviously one of the tensions that we have running the system is balancing commuters. It's a very different system during the week and on the weekends. And so during the week, it's basically commuters using it to get around downtown for the most part. And the neighborhoods kind of rebalance themselves. On the weekend, it's a very different system where it's it's a lot. It's actually a lot less predictable, the patterns that we get, because um, people are riding along the lakefront. People are riding all over downtown. And then they're moving bikes around the neighborhoods, but we don't really have to do much. The rebalancing, we don't really have to do much of in the neighborhoods in general because most of the stations kind of um, rebalance themselves, or actually, all of you rebalance the stations for us instead of having to put them in a van and move them around. So um, just some of the interesting data that we found and some of the trends that kind of cool to see. So, Steven, um, and I'm not sure I can answer your question. Well, I was not uh, a question for you. <laughs> OK, go uh, So I interviewed Rodney for a story that I wrote today. Okay. And one of the questions that I asked every Somebody that I interviewed was like, what was the unexpected thing that he found? Because um, Rodney took a really methodical approach. Like, he developed a hypothesis, and then he developed some tests for it, and a lot of the tests came back like uh, congruent with his hypothesis. A couple didn't, and that was the groups. And so he found that 25% of Divi trips are done in a group. Well, that's if you subscribe to his methodology. And so his methodology is described on the first page, and it's like um, <coughs> trips are tagged as group rides if they and at least one other depart from the sta same station within three minutes of the other and arrives at the same destination <coughs> station within three minutes of the other. And then, so three minutes, I don't know, would you really like leave your friend behind for three minutes? Uh, <laughs> or maybe you're getting the bike out first and you have to stand around and wait for the other person to like get the code out or something. But uh, Gabe, I believe you also did a group methodology on your infographic, and you came up with like a 22% yeah. of trips are in groups, and your methodology limited to one minute. Yeah, right. So it seems that maybe his methodology was pretty good. <laughs> He also, I only, I didn't look at all 99 of them. You, <laughs> I'm guessing you did. I liked it most of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, the present, st the presentation style is very interesting, like a deconstructed Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. And so he was, he was using words that I didn't fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> like, so he he cut the data three ways, which then resulted in these six distinct subsets. Then resulted in eight two cubed. Uh, Existing subset, and so the the graph, the Venn diagram shows you the how six, the two times the three become the eight. 
What are the shapes up to the left in the key? Like, what, are the, what is the significance? I think those are just areas. Those just represent area. And you just compare area against another area, and it's just a size. They, I don't think they have much uh, significance in their shape. Right? No, I think they do. Don't they match the, the subsection of this big square here? Well, I think they do, but you're at least just supposed to see the area. So like the biggest intersection is between the top row and the, the left column. <laughs> Can we skype them? <laughs> I, I have a broader question about, um, so the topic has come up that we are moving bikes around in the system, not we, but the Divi folks. Yeah. Um, do you anticipate uh, with infill stations in neighborhoods, for instance, do you anticipate there being less need to um, move bikes around and, and rebalance the system? I think, yeah, I think as we add stations, part of the reason we need to rebalance is just the traffic patterns that people take. You know, there's this, some of the stations at Union Station or at Ogilvy or some of the metro stations, those are always going to empty out in the morning and they're always going to be full at night. So that is always going to be an issue. It's always going to be a challenge, especially during the week. Um, but some of the other stations, there are areas right now that we're not currently serving in River North, and other, where once we put a station there, it should actually take some pressure off the other station that it's always going empty. And for example, this, I know uh, the station at Monroe and uh, the Harbor, we're going to be, it's right now, we only have room for an 11 dock station, which is it's the busiest station, but it's also one of those ones where people show up and people immediately take the bike. And but it doesn't go full or empty very often. But the number of trips that come out of that station are amazing. Mm -hmm. But that one we're going to make, I think, 23 or more docks sometime in the next couple weeks. So that should actually uh, eliminate that as, as a rebalancing problem, or really reduce the amount of rebalancing requires. We're moving. We're shifting it slightly. Just kind of. 20 feet away and on a different sidewalk where we can actually make it two or three times the size it currently is. So I, I have a hypothesis, and this is just sort of after seeing the, we all saw a presentation on zoning last week. I kind of think it's really interesting when you look at the need to rebalance bikes. Um, I think there may be something to do with like the mix of land uses, right? That there's so much high density development downtown that there's always this draw in the morning and after work. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. I don't know if anybody had that same thing <laughs> click. I think that's kind of cool. Well, that's definitely as we're one of the things we looked at as we're kind of figuring out the expansion is we looked at the density, <coughs> um, the, the land uses, business licenses, um, residential density, commercial density, um, all those different things to kind of figure out, did some fairly simple heat mapping to figure out where we could, ex where we could or should expand to based on that exactly what you mentioned, sure. zoning and the kind of land use. So I guess, I mean, this would add to um, Daniel's argument last week about increasing zoning or doing away with zoning in neighborhoods where there's like a finite amount of development, so to speak. Just like. Thank you. Thanks.